Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today we're going to discuss similaritons. In the previous video, which should be linked right up here, we discussed solitons, which are these interesting pulses that can arise in optical fibers with a nonlinearity and a negative beta 2 dispersion parameter. In those situations, if the pulse has a sufficiently high power, it's possible for the effects of self phase modulation and negative group velocity dispersion to perfectly cancel out, at least if the pulse has a hyperbolic secant envelope. If the pulse is even more powerful, it's possible for it to oscillate back and forth, as we're seeing in this animation right here. Now, we also investigated in a different video something called optical wave breaking. In that situation, we basically have the same type of fiber as for the soliton, except the beta 2 dispersion parameter is now positive. So, what happens here is that the presence of the non dearity is going to generate a red, red chirp on all leading slopes of pulses and a blue chirp for all the trailing slopes. And because beta 2 is positive, it means that red light propagates faster than blue light. So in total, that's going to cause the pulse to basically break apart and spread out as we're seeing in this present animation right here. So it turns out that for the case of the beta 2 being positive, we don't get this kind of stable configuration unless the attenuation parameter is actually positive, meaning that we have gain in the medium. So in other words, if we have a fiber with positive beta 2, a nonlinearity, but also positive gain, we can get something called a similariton, which is what we're going to be discussing today. Now, to motivate that a little bit more, I think it's helpful to think about optical wave breaking in the case where there's no gain, simply like an avalanche, where we have all of this sort of power, or snow in this case, collected in one location and it sort of spreads out as we move forward. But what happens if instead of having only a fixed amount of matter that can sort of spread out, we keep adding more stuff on top? Basically, we can think of this a little bit like this hourglass we're seeing right here, where we can see that the pile of sand at the bottom here does indeed spread out over time, but we're also constantly adding more and more stuff on top of it, causing it to sort of retain its shape as we go forward while still broadening a little bit. So essentially that's what's happening when we create these similaritons. We simply have a beta 2 value that's positive, and a gain value is also positive. So the pulse does spread out, but we keep adding more material on top of it, or more light in this case. So let's actually take a look and try and simulate that. So here I've imported my usual library for doing the split step wave method solution to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Then I've set up a time base with a certain resolution and a certain number of points. Next, I've defined a fiber here with a negative attenuation coefficient. So that means we have positive gain. And I think I might actually change this part of the interface at some point because it feels a little bit inconvenient that you need to specify a negative number to get positive gain. But whatever the case, um, I've also selected a positive value of beta 2, as well as a gamma value that controls the nonlinearity, and a fiber length and a certain number of steps I divided this fiber into in the set direction. So with the fiber set up, I've also defined a few input signals we can launch in to see what happens. So here we just have a regular uh, Gaussian signal, and then one that is square, and one that follows this hyperbolic secant that, again, is characteristic of the solitons when beta 2 is negative. And finally, I also have a triangular input signal to see what happens to all these four different ones when we launch them into the, the same fiber. So with all of those specified, I've launched them into the same fiber individually in turn, as you can see here. And basically, all of the simulations have run through. And that should allow us to take a look at the output here. So here we see the input and output of the Gaussian pulse. So we see the Gaussian pulse down here in blue. And we can see that the final result sort of looks like a quadratic shape like this that has gotten much broader as we propagate down. And again, that should make sense because we saw an optical wave breaking that the pulse would overall broaden. But now the addition of a positive amount of gain is going to stack more and more power on top. So we end up with this sort of parabolic shape here. And maybe that shouldn't be too surprising for the case of a Gaussian, because after all, a Gaussian almost looks like a parabola in the first place. But what's interesting is that that parabolic shape doesn't just, doesn't just arise for the Gaussian. It also arises for the square pulse, as you can see here. We start off with this very sort of rigid, solid square pulse, and then... In the end, we get something that very much looks like a parabola, apart from a little bit of optical wave breaking taking place here at the, the edges of the pulse. And as a matter of fact, the same thing happens for the hyperbolic secant pulse right here, with still a bit of optical wave breaking. And finally, we see the same thing again for the triangular pulse right here. So it's kind of interesting that we can launch these four different pulse shapes into the same fiber, and in the end, after propagating for sufficiently long distance, we get basically the same parabolic shape coming out. Now, this shape here, which actually just is a uh, regular parabola with a negative curvature, is the shape that's characteristic of these similaritons. And the reason why we call them similaritons is that, unlike solitons, which can actually perfectly pres preserve their shape, or at least have a consistent oscillation that's predictable, the similaritons will all have these um, parabolic envelopes, but these will keep like broadening and expanding and increasing in size as we propagate down. So again, they look sort of self-similar in terms of the overall geometry, even though the amplitude and the duration is going to is going to increase. 
So it's actually possible to show mathematically that this parabolic shape is the sort of um, one that any pulse shape will actually converge towards in this sort of situation. It's a little bit complicated, but I've linked a paper in the description that should explain the details if you're interested. So you might wonder, like, why, why do you have this parabolic shape of all shapes? Well, I think the essential idea here is that just as the hyperbolic secant happens to be the mathematical shape that perfectly balances the effect of self-phase modulation and anomalous dispersion, the parabola just happens to be the shape that balances out the behavior of positive dispersion, nonlinearity, and gain. So I think it's just kind of a coincidence that um, this happens to be the sort of magical shape, but it turns out it's quite, uh, quite easy to understand in terms of the, uh, the math that describes the overall envelope. So um, with all that in mind, I've also created a little animation here that should show us how the four pulses here evolve as we propagate down the length of the fiber. Let me see if I can align this so it's a little bit more nice. So anyway, we can see here that here we have the, the Gaussian, the square pulse, the hyperbolic secant, and the triangle, and they, as they evolve for the uh, propagation to the same, same fiber here. Now, what's kind of interesting is that you can see all of them start off with the same shape, and very slowly, as we get these peaks are amplified by the presence of the gain, we can see that they sort of turn more and more parabolic. You can see this doesn't really look like a Gaussian anymore. It's way too sort of sharp in the, in the edges right here. I think actually the... Um, um, simulatron behavior, the convergence towards a parabolic pulse, is most striking for the square pulse here, because as you saw just a moment ago, it started with a lot of uh, wiggling and optical wave breaking, but eventually one of these sort of peaks that arise actually gets sort of picked up by the amplification and starts to grow into this parabolic shape here. It's kind of inter interesting to note as well that the triangular pulse down here in the corner seems to be the slowest one to converge towards a parabola. Now I think the reason why that happens is that the very sharp um, slopes of this triangular pulse will basically all experience very strong surface modulation, so they'll very quickly sort of broaden out and then flatten out, and then the similarity behavior sort of starts to pick up after that broadening has happened and it begins to look more like a parabola. Then it sort of takes, uh, speeds up and starts to converge towards the parabolic shape. Also, you may have noticed there's a bit of sort of a noisy wiggling on top of the square pulse. Uh, please just ignore that. I think it's just a numerical artifact because I made the step size a bit too, uh, a bit too large, but you might want to play around with this notebook and maybe minimize and see what happens if you download it right below. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, just for um, sake of interest, I also tried to propagate an initially parabolic signal through this fiber to see what would happen. And after doing that, I basically uh, just printed out the chirp across the, uh, the pulse right here. What we see is that after we get one of these similarities on pulses, we can see that it has a linear chirp across its duration going from a uh, red color on the left-hand side towards a blue color when we move to the, the right, because you see the chirp increase over here. Okay, so why do we get that? Well, it's actually kind of um, obvious in a way because the chirp is defined as the negative derivative of the phase with respect to time. And due to the nonlinearity, this uh, phase will depend on the local power of the field. And if that field looks like an inverted parabola, taking its derivative with respect to time simply gives us something that increases linearly with time, as you can see right here. So why do we care about this? Well, you might be able to see this little uh, next header I've created here. But the essential idea is that if we have a pulse that has a linear chirp, it's very easy to do uh, pulse compression because all we have to do is take this simulator pulse and launch it into a medium with a negative dispersion parameter. That's going to cause all of the uh, blue light that's slowed down to catch up to all the red light that's sped up. And once they overlap, we should get a very large increase in the power. So to see that in action, I've taken this um, parabolic simulator pulse right here and just copied it into a new input signal. And then I've set up a different fiber right down here which has no attenuation or gain, and has no nonlinearity, but does have a negative value of the beta 2 parameter. And we've also slightly changed the length here for convenience, as you'll see in a moment. So if we launch that uh, simulator pulse with the linear chirp into the medium, as I've done here, we can take a look at the output result. And indeed, we see that we get a very, very large spike in the power right here. And you can see we start out with this very broad initial pulse, and we get a big power spike coming out. And it's a bit more striking to see, perhaps, with this... Um, pulse evolution chart here. We start with the input pulse down here. And you can see how propagating through this medium sort of causes it to be struck together and focused down into a single uh, instant right here with very high power. And of course, I've also created a small animation of this process. So we can see this parabolic pulse begins to collect itself as it propagates through the negative dispersion medium. And at the very end, we get this huge power spike all the way up to a peak power of around 25 watts. So let's just see that one more time. We see the overall duration of the simulator pulse coming out of the fiber with positive dispersion is around let's say, um, maybe 200 picoseconds in total, but that gets shrunk down to just a few uh, few picoseconds like so, in a huge, huge spike. And again, peak power here is around maybe uh, maybe around 1 watt, but it goes all the way up to 25 watts. So this is really a 
very strong process for increasing the peak power of one of these pulses. You might want to might uh, it might be obvious now that these simulation pulses have quite a lot of utility because if you can create a gain medium with a positive dispersion, make it sufficiently long, you can generate these very highly energetic pulses with a broad duration but also linear chirp, then launch that into a medium with negative dispersion and get a huge um, a pulse out with a huge peak power and a very, very short duration in the end. And of course, that's very useful if you're doing nonlinear optics or maybe some kind of laser, uh, laser cutting. So I hope you find this video interesting. Feel free to check out some of my other ones right over here and stay tuned for more. Bye-bye.